Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France Venquette debate, a crucial donor conference in Brussels while fighting continues in Afghanistan. We're talking about it in the debate uh, with uh, the former Afghan ambassador to Canada and France, Omar Samad, also uh, joining us uh, from, uh, who's now the CEO, by the way, of Silk Road Consulting from Washington. We're with uh, political analyst uh, Wahid Fakir, uh, former Pakistani diplomat, Musharraf uh, Zaidi, whose uh, column you can read in the news newspaper, and uh, France24.com senior editor Leela Jacinto, who just before the break uh, was talking about the internal dynamics of Afghanistan, the foreign dynamics. Uh, one tweet on the hashtag F24 debate, the support from that donor conference will be delivered with conditions to be met. No blank checks anymore, exclamation uh, point. Uh, the internal dynamic, Leela, you were mentioning it just before the break, uh, uh, how Ashraf Khani not so good, uh, not as good as his predecessor when it comes to uh, creating what you, we were talking about, the big tent. Uh, predecessor, I got to say, uh, Hamid Karzai, who sounds like a man who's running for president. He's been, uh, uh, he, he regularly receives people every day. He talks about having one of these uh, so-called lawyer jurgas, which are uh, these uh, big council meetings, big right. council meetings, big Afghan council meetings. Uh, what, what's your reaction to that? Well, I mean, he is the first uh, uh, Afghan leader to step down peacefully, but he is very close to the Arg, the, uh, the, the presidential palace in Kabul. And yes, he has been, uh, you know, uh, uh, Karzai's residence is, is really the headquarters of discontent in Afghanistan right now. One of the primary reasons for the discontent has been Ashraf Ghani's reaching out to Pakistan. So there are many old players, you know, the old political elites who are very suspicious of Islamab Islamabad's game in, in Pakistan. Uh, and, and so there are discontents. There are discontents of uh, Tajiks, uh, who are represented by uh, his CEO, uh, Abdullah Abdullah, even though uh, Abdullah is half Pashtun. Uh, the irony of uh, Ashraf Ghani reaching out to Pakistan, which is, you know, there, there is no doubt that Afghanistan needs a change of strategy. Something, you know, you've got to change the way uh, business is being done. But the relations between Kabul and Islamabad have not improved improved, despite, uh, you know, uh, so much of, you know, Ashraf Ghani really rode on that. Uh, uh, Pakistan is sending back Afghan ref refugees. You know, this is something that Pakistan didn't do since 1979. So they're playing a very mm -hmm. tough game with them. Why are they and sending the them back? Why are they sending them back? Well, because of because of the, the you know the security situation, Kabul Kabul has has called on uh, Pakistan to control uh, the security situation. What is happening is Pakistan is once again focused on the Afghan Tali uh, the Pakistani Taliban, the TTP, and some of those former militants have are joining Daesh and Islamic State group. So so they are, they are conducting an assault inside Pakistan, but they're pushing jihadists into Afghanistan. It's that same old problem again. Pushing uh, uh, jihadists, but also pushing civilians, uh, refugees who've been in the country for decades. Uh, sometimes they've been going back at a rate of 5,000 a day. We're going to take a look at a France 24 report. 35 years ago, Ahmed fled these war-ravaged mountains during the Soviet-Afghan conflict. He was one among the nearly three million Afghans who have since then sought refuge in neighboring Pakistan. But last week, the Pakistani police ordered him to pack up and leave. We took all our things, even the Quran, curtains, plates, our furniture, almost everything. Yet I grew up in Pakistan, I got married there, I spent most of my life there. There is disappointment, but many are also happy to be going home. We had problems in Pakistan. That's why we have returned. I feel like I'm being freed from prison. Behind closed doors, Afghans blame Pakistani authorities for this. In June, their residency permits were not renewed. Since then, 5,000 people make the journey back to Afghanistan every day. They all receive $400 each in aid from the UN. Come here, take the form and we will register you. We give them rooms and blankets for a night. Then in the morning, we start the process of sending them back to their villages. 
The homecoming will be difficult. 75% of them are under the age of 24 and were born in Pakistan. They are coming back to a country in a state of near civil war. Be careful. Because of the conflict, there are a lot of mines and unexploded bombs. It is important not to touch them. Since January, 300,000 Afghans have come back from Pakistan, and more keep coming. The UN has identified an extra $152 million to help the nearly 1 million Afghans expected back in 2016. Should be pointed out that uh, Pakistan uh, harbors the third largest number of refugees in the world right now, 1.4 million. Musharraf Zaidi, do you support the uh, return of Afghans to uh, Afghanistan from Pakistan? Uh, I think, uh, you know, my position on this has been quite clear. Uh, I think it's an absolute... Uh, it's, it's a very, very deep disappointment to me that, that my country's government has chosen to express its dissatisfaction with the negative propaganda, the kind that was just shared by the previous speaker about, uh, you know, Pakistan's role. Taking out our frustration on these people, many of, the, of whom I consider Pakistani as much as they, they, they consider themselves Afghan, to ask these people to leave, people who've spent their entire lives in, 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 in our country, uh, who I believe have added to the vibrancy and the cultural diversity in our country, and people who, uh, who as human beings, I believe, have a right. If, if the argument for refugees uh, is one that people like myself and, and some other than others will make uh, for, for the United Kingdom and the United States and France, then that same argument has to stand for, for Pakistan. So I believe that Afghan refugees uh, I feel, and, and I think that this is a feeling that is widely shared in Pakistan, that Afghans will always have a home uh, in Pakistan. It's extremely unfortunate that the that the current uh, bitterness um, that has been uh, that has been uh, injected into the into the into the region has caused the government to to make this decision and and to ask people to leave. But I don't think. But just we, have a, we I'm uh, sorry, we don't. We, there's something we don't understand because the Pakistani are fighting the Taliban, the Afghans are fighting the Taliban. Why aren't relations better? Uh, look, there is a. Uh, just to give you one example, there is a man named Fazlullah who uh, who wrought, who wrecked a lot of havoc in Pakistan, and. He, uh, after the army went to clear the area that he had uh, that he had come to dominate, uh, his forces were routed. His fighters were routed. Uh, many of them were killed. He escaped uh, through, you know, the mountains into Afghanistan. And uh, it's widely believed that once he reached Afghanistan, he was uh, he was supported and enabled to get back up on his feet by elements of people that are that are part of the Afghan state as revenge for what Afghans believe uh, to have been duplicitous Pakistani policy. Uh, all of this has been lubricated by other regional powers, particularly India, uh, in a, and this is the proxy war that, uh, that Omar was, was referring to. I think How so? How has it been lubricated by India? Well, the, uh, the Indian state has always sought to uh, ensure that its power is projected through uh, Kabul as a uh, con constraining factor on, on Pakistani influence in, in Afghanistan. Concurrently, Pakistan has, I think, unfairly sometimes sought to influence political outcomes in Kabul, uh, largely driven by the paranoia, the legitimate paranoia of, uh, of Indian influence in Afghanistan, uh, and, and oftentimes uh, going far beyond what, what is legitimate in terms of who Pakistan has supported and how it has uh, expressed that support. Uh, the, the short version of the story, of course, is that as long as Afghanistan continues to be a battleground for countries other than Afghans, whether it's Iranians or it's Indians or it's Pakistanis, the Afghan people will continue to suffer. And I think it's a terrible thing that the Afghans have to bear the brunt of a contest, uh, a regional and geopolitical contest that they frankly have no stake in. The only way that everybody can be a winner is if Afghans are winners. And for Afghans to be winners, uh, Indians, Pakistanis, Iranians, Russians, the Chinese and the Americans have to have to make that commitment to themselves and to each other let me, that let, they want to see Afghans win. 
Now let me bring this. Let me bring this to to, to Omar Samad, uh, Ambassador Samad. The the uh, how much would you say that the rivalry between Pakistan and India, and we've seen it quite bluntly with the the, the resurgence of that border tension in Kashmir. How much of it, right now, is bleeding into the Afghan conflict? You know, we have heard this. Uh, theory, this uh, accusation uh, for years now. And we keep asking for this type of evidence and we have almost nothing to show that the Indians are allowed by the Afghans to take action against Pakistan from Afghanistan. Now, whatever happens between Pakistan and India on the on the uh, eastern front of Pakistan and on, in Kashmir is of obviously none of our business. But we, we need to uh, look at things uh, in, in context, and, and we need to be very honest about the history behind this, the evidence behind what has happened, the good and bad Taliban games that have been played. Fazlullah is also seen by Afghans as a bad Talib whether he's Pakistani or Afghan. And we well, given, actually well, have killed many of his associates and affiliates. Let, let, me, let, let, me, let me finish. Fazlullah may be on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but we are also looking for him. And we have killed, as I said, we have killed several of his associates. How many Talibs who are coming and killing Afghans in Afghanistan have you eliminated in Pakistan? I'm not asking, I mean, you personally, but I'm asking the Pakistani state and the Pakistani military establishment, how many Afghan Talibs have they captured, those who ha whose lists have been given to them, those whose addresses in Kuwaita, in Karachi, in Peshawar have been given to the Pakistani government? Nothing has been done. The Akhanis, et cetera, et cetera, nothing has been done. They've all been protected. They've all been given sanctuaries, and they have been killing Afghans at least in the, in the case of the Talibs, for 20 years. Before that, it was Golbuddin Hekmatyar, who was the blue-eyed guy that they liked and they gave everything to. Then, you know, he was disposable. We want to f find a solution. Ashraf Ghani wanted to find a solution. He tried. I was in Kabul. I was in many of those meetings when the Pakistani ISI chief and many others came. They told us the enemy of Pakistan is the enemy of Afghanistan. The enemy of Afghanistan is the enemy of Pakistan. At the end of the day, that did not turn out to be the case. Musharraf Zaidi. Look, I, I think I've expressed much, uh, much the same frustration. I think that you know, Pakistan, serious Pakistanis have been calling on, at a minimum, the restriction of the time and space that's afforded to groups that, that that attack Afghanis. Anybody that attacks Afghans is an enemy, not just of the Afghans, but of Pakistanis, particularly Pakistanis like me. So I think as far as the uh, the issue of the Afghanis or the Afghan Taliban, if, if they have the operating space and time to to operate in Pakistan, that is on Pakistan. And, and that is something that the Pakistani authorities need to need to crack down on. That's that's an advocacy that's been happening within Pakistan for some time. And that, I think, is is something that we're getting closer and closer to. I think things are a lot better today in terms of the the limiting of the space uh, for these groups than they were five years ago. And I think five years from now, they'll be much better. But I think in the interim, the uh, the suggestion that India does not uh, stoke uh, anti-Pakistan behavior in Afghanistan, I think is, uh, you know, perceptions matter a lot. And I think for in, pa in the Pakistani perception, that's a laughable sort of assertion. Whether or not, you know, Afghans feel uh, differently about that or Indians feel differently about that, I think is, is, uh, is, is really almost irrelevant. Because right, as long as the Pakistani authorities continue to feel that the can, Afghan Can I just make one point? Yeah. Go ahead. Can I make one point? Uh, uh, if the Indians are stoking from Afghanistan, we have had 15 years of NATO, U.S. intelligence, military presence in Afghanistan controlling Afghan land and skies. None of them have ever come forward and said the Indians are stoking. None of them have. If you don't believe the Afghans, well, I think the then of, the rest I of think the world the has been there. Well, no, I, I do. In fact, I believe the Afghans before I believe many others, uh, Omar. But the fact is that Bramdad Bukti was uh, afforded sanctuary in Afghanistan. 
And his role as a uh, terrorist in Pakistan is well known to you, and it's well known to other guests on, on the show, and it's very well known to Afghans, and it's particularly well known to the Indians. And again, these I've just given you two examples, and, and they are irrefutable examples of people that have had the space to act against Pakistani interests from Afghan soil. The fact of the matter is, however, that it is Pakistan's responsibility to be the bigger country, because it, is, because it is the bigger country, to not take out its frustration on Afghan refugees, to ensure that what space is available to the Haqqanis and other anti-Afghan groups is shrunk and eliminated, and to make sure that if somebody like Ashraf Ghani is reaching out to Pakistan, to meet him more than halfway. Where Pakistan has failed on that, people like myself have been extremely critical. Where I think Afghans can do a better job is not allowing themselves or their country to be used as an instrument of provocation against Pakistan. And I think that that you know, that's something that's going to take some time, but I'm very hopeful that, inshallah, that, that the ultimate destiny of this region is peace, and the route to peace is a stable, peaceful, and prosperous Afghanistan. No country in the region can do better All without right. Afghanistan doing better. Let, let me just bring it, because there's a lot of other points to talk about, and one in particular which, which concerns uh, not just, we were talking about refugees, it's not just Pakistan that's in the eye of the storm when it comes to returning uh, refugees and migrants to Afghanistan. The European Union denying allegations that its aid is conditional on uh, the uh, uh, Ill limited return of illegal migrants. However, listen to the remarks by the German foreign minister entering that donor conference in Brussels. We also expect from Afghanistan cooperation on migration issues. Of course, that's also what I should achieve. Young people should find a perspective for their own future in their own country and should not be forced to leave. All right, that's provoked a, a, a lot of reactions. Uh, uh, this one on the hashtag F24 debate, around 50 to 100 people get killed every day in Afghanistan. The government is dealing in Brussels to return refugees back as Afghanistan is a safe zone. Off the record, Wahid Fakiri, uh, Afghan diplomats quoted in the press as saying that, uh, well, the EU played hardball on this one. I do believe that the EU is pressuring the Afghan government to take some refugees, but I, I believe it is a uh, unrealistic uh, demand. And uh, yes, some they will send some, they will some send to Afghanistan, but the, the, uh, more will come because as long as we we do not deal with the real issue in Afghanistan providing a, a good governance, providing a, a, a clean government, a effective government. The, the, <clears throat> these uh, waves of refugees will come out of Afghanistan because of unemployment, of uh, rampant insecu insecurity. So whether the Afghan government agree or not, I don't think it will uh, affect uh, significantly, significantly the flow of refugees. Omar Samad, what's your reaction when you hear Frank-Walter Steinmeier say that uh, we expect from Afghanistan cooperation on migrant issues. Well, I'm, I'm uh, disheartened because um, he uses the word migrant. And what we are talking about in reality is overwhelmingly refugees. They are leaving the country. They were not leaving the country at this rate three, four, five years ago. There were still, uh, you know, some semblance of security and, and, and hope. Uh, and prospects for the future. Things have been very shaky uh, lately, uh, especially the, the, the end of the huge mission that the international community undertook in Afghanistan, which in itself created sort of a bubble economy. And that bubble economy ended at the end of 2014. And as a result, hundreds of thousands of people were left without jobs and an income uh, to, to live off of. So uh, we need to uh, deal with this issue I agree with Mr. Fakiri uh, at the root, you know, and look at the root causes, and and deal with the root causes. At the same time, there is a humanitarian aspect to this, and there are some international laws governing these issues. You can't really uh, push and pressure people to go back if they feel threatened and insecure, uh, or they have lost uh, loved ones. 
uh, and taking every risk in the world to make it to a safe place. Now, there are those who are opportunistic, and there are those who are taking advantage of this for other reasons. And I think that you have to sift through this and vet them enough to be able to differentiate between real refugees and those who are opportunistic. Well, Jacinto, what do, you, what do you make of it all? What is it, does it say more about Afghanistan or, or the European Union, this story? This is, this is a very poor statement on the European Union. You know, this story was, was broken by The Guardian. And, uh, you know, I, I saw the uh, it's a restricted document that came out in March. So, uh, you know, months ahead, uh, you know, this document states very clearly that we're going to leverage. So this wasn't grandstanding for public opinion. This was something done. In Ex private, exactly, and you know, and the wording, and the wording is very much, you know, you see the arm, t arm twisting that 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 uh, the EU is doing, and you know, all this aid, the, you know, the, these commitments of, of millions of dollars, Europe understands that you have to keep the commitment going in Afghanistan because then it, if if not, it becomes Afghanistan's problems, and I think you know, one of the tragedies of this document is that the people who have written it understand very clearly, uh, you know, how difficult difficult it is in Afghanistan and are still proposing this sending uh, Af Afghans back. Because basically now, you know, it's, l let's admit it's, you know, Syria and Iraqis, you know, all men are not equal. So if Syrian and Iraqi refugees, you simply can't uh, push them back because, you know, European politicians cannot really look at their domestic audiences when Syria is burning like that. Afghanistan, you know, the U.S. pulled out in 2014, and everybody seems to sort of wash their hands off it. So, you know, if you if you send Afghans mm. back to a very dangerous country, European politicians are not going to hear that much from their domestic audiences. So Afghans are losing, uh, you know, they're being pushed out of Pakistan, they're being sent back to Europe. Uh, it's, it's, it's really the worst nationality to be. No, I mean, you know, it's a very bad, it's in a very bad situation right now. All right, Leila Jacinta, I want to thank you. I want to thank Omar Samad for being with us uh, from Geneva, Wahid Fakiri and uh, uh, Musharraf Zaidi in Washington. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. And we say hello to uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. So we've you heard Leela Jacinto there. That's right. And it is one of the topics, deep, the deportation of uh, Afghans back uh, to Afghanistan that is creating a lot of uh, reaction on social media. Let's take a look at... Uh, on Twitter, the Enlightenment Movement, uh, which is uh, the name given to a protest essentially that was held in Brussels today uh, outside uh, the Afghan conference. I am so proud of being Hazara. So this is the minority, uh, many of whom are now uh, in Europe and may face deportation back uh, to Afghanistan. Thousands of Hazara joined in this Brussels protest against what they say is systemic systemic discrimination in Afghanistan. This is why, of course, they don't want to be sent back. And you can see photos here of Hazara women uh, uh, calling for ba what they call balanced development, or I think it, that's even a term used by the, um, the European uh, Foreign uh, Commissioner, uh, for foreign uh, balanced development rather in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, a quote there that has been shared from President Ghani, Afghanistan has five million refugees outside of the country. Our body of politics is incomplete without them. So an appeal, I suppose, for uh, the return of some of those uh, in exile uh, and uh, for, you know, improvement on those issues. Tired of systemic discrimination, Afghanistan is not safe. Don't deport the Hazara refugees, uh, calls uh, Zir Zad, uh, one Twitter user uh, reacting to that. We want justice, says another, stop this discrimination and deportation to Afghanistan. So a lot of people uh, really uh, opposing the idea that uh, deportations should take place at all because of security questions and discrimination questions. This, just two final comments on this, uh, Francois. The sad part of this whole mass deportation is the EU's use of aid as a bargaining chip to compel the Afghan government to sign the deal. So some people are unhappy to see those two issues being connected, the question of aid and the question of, I suppose, uh, refugees, which you might argue should be uh, not uh, linked to the question of aid. As long as Afghanistan is so desperately dependent on foreign aid in Brussels, uh, says Shuja Rabani, another Twitter user, I find it hard to see us 
as a sovereign state. And I suppose maybe on these questions, the Afghan government is finding its hands somewhat tied because of the dependence on aid from Brussels. All right. Many thanks, uh, thanks for that, well. James Creed. And I want to thank our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate.